to turn the volume up. I know. Hello and welcome to another episode of the AI Show Live. Uh, my name is Seth Juarez. 
and I'm excited. We have a really good show today. At least that's what I keep telling myself. Y'all can tell me what you think. Uh, today we've got two guests, uh, Gary Pretty and Krishesh Oberoi, to talk about what's new in the world of conversational AI. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I They let me play with their demo a little bit. It's fantastic, so make sure you have your questions ready for them. Uh, also, today, Avi, we're going to continue working on our Rock, Paper, Scissors project, the social media website of the future. I'm just saying. I mean, we may or may not be the next huge social media empire we're building it live in front of everybody so i mean if you want to join uh now's a good time all right so uh i thought we'd go to the huge uh where we talk about what is it that we're actually doing and in another uh uh segment of me using equipment that i probably shouldn't have bought during the pandemic We are going to review what we're doing today. By the way, where is everybody coming from? I'm, let me go over here and see where everyone's where, where everyone's coming from. I, I couldn't get that out. I, where everyone is coming from. Uh, hello, Ivana. We're so glad you're here, by the way. Uh, Hver, H- Havatska Cat. I don't know what that is. And Jenny Skew, number seven. Hello, my friend. And then we have Vino Thrajendran. Hopefully I got that right. Where's everybody from? Uh, everybody uh, happy to be here? Uh, I'm excited. It's a Friday. Time to put the background music on. Finland. I have not been to Finland yet. Uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, oh, I got it right. Vinotra Gendron. Wonderful. Wonderful. I absolutely love cultures, names, languages. I know English. I know Spanish. I took French in school and Russian. Vancouver. Ankit, welcome. Austria, India, Turkey. My mom loves Turkey. In fact, she's like learning how to sing all the songs that she wanted to visit. But then, you know, the panna cotta happened and here we are. Okay. So what are we doing today? Number one, uh, what's new conversational AI? What's new in conversational AI? Pretty excited about that. There's a, there's a really cool demo um, that they're going to do. There, there's actually some really cool new stuff. Colombia, Germany, happy Friday. Hello, Seattle. Welcome, Nicole. Uh, Diego and Skillsoft from Germany. Das ist unglaublich. Danke. That's the German I know. Uh, let's see, Colombia. Bienvenidos a todos los hispanohablantes. All right, someone from another country whose language I speak needs to say something. So don't be like, hey, I'm from Klingon. I'm a Klingon. I don't, I don't know Klingon. Number two, we are going to be continuing with our Rochambeau project. Rochambeau project. And I wrote down some notes because, by the way, none of this stuff is scripted when I do it. Um, not the coding bits. This is all like happening live. This is like artisanally created AI. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to finish our save and load model bits, uh, uh, load model. Remember, we're moving we're moving from uh, PyTorch to PyTorch Lightning. So just FYI on that, we're doing that. Uh, so we're going to do save load model. Uh, and for those that want a little recap, Avi, Avi I'm totally going to do a recap as well. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to be better about arg parsing. Better arg parse uh, for the model. Apparently, PyTorch Lightning has some really cool arg parsey things, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to add what I like to call a scoring file. Uh, this is a py Python file. Sometimes people call it inference. We'll do that. And then, then if we if like I have done everything correctly, where's my mouse? Come on, mouse. I, like I made my mouse really big because I'm getting old. I couldn't find it for a second. It was quite embarrassing. South Korea, welcome. Kwang Hyung Cho, hopefully I said that right. And Jay McCormick from downtown Seattle. Jay, welcome. We should hang out. 
after, you know, the weirdness is over. And then finally, uh, if we get this scoring file done, and this is like the bonus round, we're going to have to revisit our Rochambeau bow.ai site. I, I did like DocuSaurus, but we're going to have to like have a vote. Should we go view or react? Now, again, remember, AI isn't real until you've done something with it in JavaScript. Actually, nothing is real in computer land until there's a JavaScript framework. That's what I've been told. I don't want to go against the internet elders and sisters. They take this crap seriously. I know. I know. All right. So this is what we're doing today. By the way, uh, Gary and Vishesh are awesome. I asked them to stay on and ask answer any questions. You know, like the way this works, and, and I'll tell y'all, because uh, View, James says View, Blazer. I would love to do Blazer, but I just, I have thoughts about Blazer. I, I may be wrong. So maybe we'll get into the Blazer combo, Jay, a little bit on. James, I've done View. I love it. But everyone's like, if you're cool, you do React. But then again, like six years ago, they were like, if you're cool, you got to do Angular. Where are all those people? You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. So uh, let me bring on my guests here so they we can see them all. Uh, let me let me move again. Equipment purchased during the panicata that we may or may not need. By the way, today I actually did purchase equipment during the whatever the this period of time is my soundboard that we're actually going to need for today's session. So we're gonna we have to get a round of applause here uh, for uh, good job buying the soundboard, Seth. All right, let's bring our guests on here. Uh, let me remove this. Uh, there's Gary and there's Vishesh. How you doing, my friends? Oh, they're muted. I got to unmute them. Sorry. <laughs> I'm on mute. You're unmuted now. How you awesome. doing, my friends? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having us on again. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Gary, I know I've had you on. Vishesh, have you ever been on one of my shows? I think billed last year. It's been a oh. while. I'm a, I apologize up front for the dumpster fire that will shortly happen. <laughs> no worries. The weather is nice outside, so you know we'll make up for it towards the end. <laughs> He's like, the weather's now nice outside, so could you hurry up? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone does like a collective gasp. Did he just say to hurry up? Yes, he did. I did right. not. No, those are those are not my words. <laughs> Vishesh was like, "It's really nice outside. I'm <laughs> really excited to be here." I get it, Vishesh. We'll hurry. <laughs> Sorry, today's <laughs> Friday. I had like an extra long week, so if it's extra goofy, apologies. But during the actual like segment, we have to be serious, right? So let me get this. Uh, because I mean, they pay the bills, they get mad at me. Um, it's Brenda from marketing, I'm scared. Of she could hurt me. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Um, she's like watching me right now, like on the team's chat. Oh, no, I know. So, hopefully, she's she went up to get a sip of water right now because fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All right, so, uh, friends, some instructions, uh, as we do this, uh, look at the camera the whole time. Unless you're doing your demo, uh, and right when you're about to do your demo, I'll just be like, hey, because friends, we have two demos today from two different people, which is fantastic. Uh, just be like, hey, uh, I'll be like, so can you show us? You'll be like, sure. Then just like stop talking, get your thing up and say, okay, I'm ready. And then I'll be like, okay, go. And then you'll be like, so what you see here, Seth? And that way when I edit out, I edit out the, the awkward parts, there'll be nothing left. Just be like a three second. <laughs> That's true. I'm just kidding. Oh my god, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening to me today. All right. Uh, so what I'll do is let me take this. Uh, I'll I'll be like, hey, uh, and I gotta go over here. Push this. I'm gonna say you're not gonna miss this episode of the AI show where we talk all about what's new in conversational AI with my good friends Gary and Vishesh. And then I'll and then I'll do that. Okay. And then after that, I'll be like, hello, and welcome to this episode of the AI show. We're going to talk all about what's new in the world of conversational AI. Gary, uh, uh, Gary, and uh, make sure, oh, I got to push, I got to push some buttons here. Sorry. Your names aren't showing up anymore. No! <laughs> oh, my God. I'm like pushing all the buttons and nothing's working. 
I'll be like, Gary and Vishesh, can you introduce yourselves? And then I'll start with you, Gary, and then we'll go with you, uh, Vishesh, and then we'll go from there. What do you think? Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay. 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 So, all right. Time to be professional. I'm going to move my drink so I don't break anything. Here we go. Uh, but for some reason, your titles aren't showing up. Why is that? Like I demand my title. Be sure. I know. I you, you should demand it. <laughs> Dang it. I need oh I need that one extra Twitter follower. That's, uh, there we go. Wait a minute. I think what happens is when I show the banner, it goes away. Uh -huh. Gosh, okay. Right. Gosh, this is just again for everyone watching. This is what you get. Okay. <laughs> I know my mom logged in twice. So hi, mom. <laughs> twice. Okay. 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 Now we got to be serious. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So let me put the, the thing up there, uh, and then let me get my – I got to get my finger on the bumper. So banner two bumper, banner two bumper, banner two bumper. You ready? Ready. <clears throat> You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where we talk about what's new in in the world. Oh, gosh, I'm horrible at this. Okay. Uh, we got this. Uh, okay. You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where we talk about what's new in the world of conversational AI with Gary and Vishesh. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show where we're talking about all about what's new in the world of conversational AI with Gary and Vishesh. Hello, my friends. Why don't you introduce yourselves? We'll start with you, Gary. Hey, I'm Gary Pretty. I'm a senior program manager on the conversational AI team at Microsoft. Awesome. Vishesh. Hey, uh, my name is Vishesh, and I am a senior program manager on our Azure Cognitive Speed Services. Wonderful. So when we talk about conversational things, I usually think of the word bot. But at, at Microsoft, we have an Azure bot service. We have a bot framework composer amongst other things. Can we maybe get a little situated on what both of these things are and how they work together? Can we start with first the bot service, Vishesh? Yeah, so Azure Bot Service is essentially a hosted service in Azure that allows you to build bots, publish them, and um, share them across various channels. So um, you have a bunch of channels and, and, and a bunch of developers out there already use it for text. Um, we're seeing a lot of growth in voice. Uh, we introduced a voice channel called Direct Line Speech about two years ago, and uh, we're just expanding the portfolio of channels that are out there. So, you know, apart from Facebook and Teams and all the other channels you've got out there, um, we're introducing a new modality that we'll talk about. So I'm very excited for that. Awesome. So the bot service is a way to channel conversational things into multiple channels. Am I getting this right, or is it more than that? It is more than that from the perspective that you can also manage your entire development workflow. You can host it. You can, you know, make it multi-regional and, and so on. So there's a lot more to it, but the biggest value prop is the fact that we have these hosted channels where you can easily build your bot and expose it across multiple channels. That's awesome. So what is actually new? What is the newest thing, Vishesh? So the newest thing here is what we're referring to, uh, to the telephony channel in the list of channels. So the telephony channel um, is a way for you to expose your bot um, over a phone line. Um, and the most common scenario that a lot of customers have been asking us for the last few years is how can they integrate their bots um, within their contact centers as one of the key scenarios that we're trying to focus here to really make the experience much nicer, sound nicer, and also uh, create a much more natural language infused interaction, which um, typically if you call contact centers today is, is, is not always the case. So you said telephony. So I'm assuming that literally a channel where you can talk to things with sound. Am I getting this right? Uh huh. Absolutely. So we we introduce um, you know speech to text. We use the bot to compute the logic, and you can use the rest of cognitive services to process that language. And on the way out, you use text to speech. Um, uh, and in fact, one of our you know state of the art neural voices to um, sort of talk back to the to the user that's on the other end. It feels like there's a lot to stitch together. Is it hard to do? It's not hard to do, but given our platform strategy, we're providing a lot of Lego blocks. It gives developers full flexibility based on what their modality is, based on what their you know contact center setup is, if they have one or not. So we provide lots of options, and that introduce a bunch of Lego blocks. 
Awesome. Well, I feel like I want to take a look at it. Can you show us how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, why don't we share my screen? All right. So let's make sure I got your screen here. Add to screen. And then, uh, OK, uh, go. So let me walk you through a, a typical solution architecture here real quick. So when we think about you know customers building bots, um, most customers are or developers are familiar with Azure Bot Framework. You know, they end up using cognitive services, you know, services like QA Maker, Lewis, and Text Analytics are very popular as well. Um, in addition to that, you know, you expect them to um, uh, integrate with APIs, you know, with your enterprise systems, with you know, different services that you might be hosting or in, in the cloud or on premises. But what really gets interesting is that more often than not, um, we sort of hear feedback from customers that they want to expose that same bot, same capability within their contact centers as well. So they can um, make sure that their you know, um, actual sort of human agents that are in the contact centers are productive, as well as you know, help deflect some of the traffic. And, and some of these stories are real world and, and have been you know, um, growing exponentially because of the pandemic or panacotta, as you refer to Seth. Um, and in this case, I think what, what we decided to do was invest in what we're referring to the telephony channel for bot framework itself. So with this telephony channel, um, you get a full duplex uh, voice interaction experience, which is you have the capability to interrupt the bot at any point you want and, and create a much more immersive experience in addition to exposing our core speed services. And cool. So as you're going through, basically what you've done is this new channel allows you through enterprise systems to literally access telephones to do actual phone calls correct and 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 the way we do that is actually using um uh, a service called azure communication services that we um introduced at ignite last year um that some of the folks have already you know been been pinging us about a lot and one of the ways you can expose your bot is through what we call the pstn uh, network or just a phone number and, and that's sort of the starting premises of it, where if a caller comes to your contact center, you can transfer that call over to the telephony channel using uh, Azure communication services as of today. That's that's cool. So, so to, to turn this on, do you have to do anything special or is it just there? So I'll, I'll walk you through that part as well. And, and one of the things that I do want to refer to is the fact that we're introducing multiple modalities to this experience as well. It's not just about a phone number. You know, if you deal with contact centers, you know about set trunking and we're actively working on implementing some of that capability within this experience. So you don't have, you can bring your existing providers for that. In addition to that, um, we've got a very rich ecosystem of ISVs that are out there, you know, building really great software to um, integrate and create, you know, gateways from contact centers to our um, speech and, and bot services. So we will be working with them um, through the API modality or MRCP being one of the more uh, popular ones as well. That's cool. That's cool. I'd love to see this in, in action on Azure. Is that possible? Absolutely. So um, I'm currently on my on my GitHub repo here. And um, if you scroll down, um, you'll notice that it's, it's actually fairly simple. All you need is sort of four steps. And one of them being creating your bot. Um, luckily for me, um, last night I created a little bot um, just called my web app bot. Um, it's fairly easy to search for um, and, and create one. And um, one of the things that we've introduced within this um, bot service uh, registration page is one of the new channels that I was referring to, which is the telephony channel in this case. Um, if I scroll down, it's right there at the bottom. Um, and as you come to this creation experience, um, we're in public preview, so just a little caveat, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, you'd notice that there are some fields here to be filled in with some references to ACS. Now, ACS refers to the Azure communication services that I was referring to earlier. So let's go off and create a quick um, communication services resource. There we go. I'll quickly create one, and um, it's fairly straightforward. Again, the typical Azure you know, nomenclature, you create a resource group and do other things uh, with it. Um, for the interest of time, I've already got one created. And the one part that we're most interested for now is phone numbers. 
So what you can do in Azure now is acquire phone numbers. Um, currently, it's um, available only in the United States, but there's a pretty um, vast expansion plan to you know, make this available globally as well. In this case, I pick up my country or region. Um, the next step is I choose my use case. In my case, you know, we're building an application, i.e. a bot that can receive calls or, or make calls. Um, and then you know, I pick if I want a local number, which comes with a standard cost with it. Um, I want to. I want this uh, phone number to be able to receive uh, calls, which is supported for Azure bots, which is which works great for us. And then I go off and choose my state. Um, since I'm in Washington, I'll pick that Seattle, and then I'll go off and acquire phone numbers. Now, again, for the interest of time, as you saw earlier, I've already got a phone number out here, and all I have to now do is copy this over and and paste um, those values in here. Now. As you can see, there's a lot of work here to you know, copy paste different phone numbers and so on. And we're working on something new that I'm, I'll be happy to give you a little sneak peek off as well. But, but hopefully this process makes sense so far. Yeah, absolutely. So, so far, basically you add a new channel, you're using mm -hmm. telephony as a new channel and all you're doing is you're hooking it up to Azure communication service with a number that you've gotten from there. Cool, it makes perfect absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as I refer to it, this feels a little tedious right now with this current UI. So let me give you a little sneak peek on what we've been working on as well on the side that will become the real experience very soon. So again, I'm, I'm on a different bot service uh, page out here, um, a blade in the, in the Azure portal. And I've got a little preview channels page here. So let's look at what that would look like. So as you can see, um, the experience feels much nicer and, and scrollable and so on. But let's click on the telephony channel real quick. Now this will give you a much easier experience where all you have to do is connect your bot to a phone number that I've already acquired. That's so cool. I'll attach my cognitive services resource, which will allow me to do speech to text, text to speech, and a bunch of other things. Um, and then I'll select the phone number that we had already created. Um, and it's as easy as that. My bot is now capable of receiving phone calls. Wow, this is this is pretty cool. And so basically, in the back end, now you have the ability, because if I remember right, and then we'll, we'll get to you, Gary, maybe to help us with this. If I remember right, it makes it so that you can write the bot logic in one place, but have multiple channels be outbound. And that's what the, the bot uh, Azure bot service is doing for you. Am I getting this right, Vishesh? Absolutely. And and in addition to you know exposing it on a phone number, we have also introduced some new concepts, such as being able to transfer. Um, typically, you know, when you're receiving calls uh, with a bot, you want to transfer a call back to the contact center or from the contact center. Then you have to record calls and just a whole host of different services and and features that you'll find on our GitHub repo as well. Is there some some documentation that we can point people to? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, um, if you go onto our GitHub page, which is just bot framework telephony, just do a quick search for it. Um, you'll find a list of everything we support, including the list of all the features. And uh, I and and I'm sure Gary will show off some of those uh, fairly soon as well. So um, I would love to you know learn from you, get feedback from you, and 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 please feel free to report issues as you experience you know uh, any bugs. Fantastic. All right, so Gary, let's go to you because we've I think it feels like we've looked at the back end of a bot. But we haven't looked at how do we write the, I mean, do you call it the front end? What do you call it? Uh, let's talk about the Bot Framework Composer, what it's for, and how you use it. Sure, yeah. So behind uh, Azure Bot Service, uh, or in conjunction with Azure Bot Service, we also have our SDK, Bot Framework SDK, and tooling, the predominant piece of which is Bot Framework Composer, which is our visual um, authoring tool for your conversation. So you can rapidly author a bot conversation and tie that with the power of the SDK at your fingertips to it to extend your bot wherever you need it. So it's a, a developer-focused tool for building conversations. That's cool. And so if it's a developer focused tool, I feel like we need a developer focused like demo to show us how it works. Do you have something you can show us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's let's take a look. Let's do it. All right, let's pause right there, add the stream. Uh one second. <clears throat> no, that's not it. Remove. Let's go to this one. Add to there you go. Let me take the corner off. All right, Gary, you're up. 
Yeah, so here I am inside of our Bot Framework Composer tool. And I've started to build out a demo uh, called Seawell Customer Service. And this bot is intended to live, as we were talking about earlier, it's like a multimodal bot. So it's intended to live both on the website via web chat. And we have a web chat control that you uh, can use to surface your bots on, on the web. Um, but also, I want to now make this available via telephony as well. So the first thing to look at is uh, our new testing feature. And you can see here, I've already started this bot, and I've started to build it out with a scheduling feature for eye exams. So I can say I'd like to schedule an eye exam. Bot's then going to respond to me and start asking me questions about my eye exam. So do I want to purchase some contact lenses? I can say yes. Have I worn them before? No, I haven't. And then I can start to actually you know, uh, put in some details, and it's going to start to say, OK, well, let's find a date. Let's find a store uh, appropriate for you. So you can see here that this bot works well via text. So that's the first thing. So previously, uh, up until sort of a recent release and the arrival of the tele telephony channel, Composer and the bot framework, primarily you were building for text-based channels. We did have direct line speech available as a, as a channel, but really we've been working behind the scenes to make sure that Composer can really light up the uh, ability to author rich speech-based experiences um, right, at your, right at your fingertips. So if we jump in here into a welcome dialogue, which is the dialogue that shows our welcome message, we can see here that I have sent a response back to the user and I can use this add action menu and I can pick from a number of them and here I'm simply sending a message to the user now we have added not only the ability for you to add multiple text variations so you can see here the welcome message and I have an alternative and the bot will pick one at random um, I've also got my suggested action so if we jump back to the test and scroll uh, scroll up you can see here's the welcome message and I picked one of my suggested actions earlier but I can now, uh, thanks to our new speech feature, I can add a speech variation. So let me grab my um, let me grab my speech. So I can now add a speech variation right here into the bot. And you can see now that my um, response now has a text variant and a speech variant, which means that depending on the channel, the bot will just do the right thing. So if you call this bot via the telephony channel, which we're going to show in just a few minutes, then it's going to use the speech variation. If I'm using it via the website, then I can use text. Because we make a lot of this idea of write once, run everywhere. But actually, the way we like to really think about it is write once and tailor for everywhere, meaning that actually we, we still get the benefits of being able to use this single application, shared state, shared conversation. But we want to make sure that that experience is lit up and is as engaging as possible, depending on the channel that the user is using. That's really cool. So that, I, I love that because like I know we had this write once, run everywhere thing, but that's really never the case. I love the write once tailor the experience or everywhere. That's really cool. Sorry, Gary. I yeah. interrupt. That's really cool. No, no, absolutely. And it's 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 really one of the uh, things that we've been working on in Bot Framework Composer uh, the most to try and light up that sort of multimodal authoring and the ability for you to do that really incredibly, incredibly rapidly and incredibly easily. The other thing that we did was to make sure that you get a rich speech experience, you need to be able to take advantage of our neural voice fonts. So our neural voice fonts are incredibly realistic sounding uh, voice fonts that you can use as part of your speech or telephony channel. And previously, what you need to make sure you do, if I if I head down, uh, down here to web chat, uh, my web chat inspector, which is a sneak peek of something that's coming soon. And I scroll down, let me expand that just a little bit. Um, and I scroll down here, you can see here that this is the actual uh, JSON that's being sent to Azure Bot Service and that's being used to drive the conversation. So here I've got the text that's being used. So, okay, you know, I found Seawell Optical Care. But you see here, here is the speak, uh, speak property. And we have what's called SSML or speech synthesis markup language text that we need to wrap around every single response. So we have a speak tag, which is essentially saying this is some SSML. And then if I scroll over, you'll also see that we've got a voice tag, which defines the voice, uh, the voice font that we want to use for uh, reading this text out. So you can see here that the same text is, is contained uh, within this tag. 
Now, previously, if you were using the SDK, this is something that you would have had to um, uh, manually do yourself. You would have to manually add these SSML tags to every single response, um, meaning if you wanted to change the voice font, that could be problematic as well. So what we've also done is tried to make the experience of authoring speech as seamless as possible. And if I head over to the settings for this bot and I head into advanced settings and scroll down just a little bit, what you'll see here is we've now got these speech specific settings. So the first thing is I now have a single place to set a voice font. And you'll see that that voice font that we just saw in the um, a bot framework uh, message JSON um, is ARIA Neural. So I could change this, for example, to GE Neural if I wanted a male uh, US uh, English voice. Um, and we also have a setting for uh, text fallback. So you might have authored a bot already for uh, web chat, you know, web-based text. And that text may be suitable to be used over a speech channel. So your speech um, property won't be set unless you go through and you set them all manually. So we've even added a setting for you to take the pain away from that. So we'll automatically, if you haven't specified an automatic speech response, we will take the text property and we will wrap it in those SML tag SSML tags automatically for you. So we've really tried to take the pain away from building uh, bots for speech. That's really cool. So basically, if you already have a bot that you've authored and you want to make it for speech, it will literally just wrap the thing in the SSML tag, <clears throat> the speech part, if that's what you want to do. Obviously, you need to go in there and make the experience a little bit better because when you write things out versus saying them, it's a little bit different. But that's really right. awesome. That literally, every single bot that really uses this now can move the telephony pretty quickly. Yeah, we're seeing customers doing this right now. So, you know, many, many customers out there over the last few years since Bot Framework was incepted have rolled out customer assistance, employee assistance internally, and they've rolled them out over text-based channels, whether that's via Microsoft Teams or it's via web chat. And now they're able to take advantage of these advancements combined with the power of the telephony channel and our rich speech stack um, and immediately enable that bot for um, sort of speech and telephony-based channels. So as I'm looking at this bot framework composer, is this is this like something on Azure? Is this where is this composer? I've seen it before, but it's been it's been like a year ago. Where does it? Yeah, live so this now? is actually it's it's a local application. So you can um, you can uh, visit. We've got an aka.ms link which will will drop out at the end. Uh, so you can go download this application and install it locally. It's also open source, so you can head over to GitHub and you can actually deploy this and run it as a web application on your local machine as well. Um, so it's an Electron app, but it integrates with all of the key cognitive services like Lewis for language understanding, Q and A Maker for question and answer capabilities and speech, um, we actually integrate with it so that you can actually uh, spend most of your time inside of Composer. There's not really a need to leave here. We actually integrate with all of those services for you. And that even includes, if I head over to the publishing tab, I can now provision all of the Azure resources I need for my bot directly into Azure. I can create one or more uh, publishing profiles, and that can all happen right from within the application. And then I can publish straight to Azure as well. So it really is a um, you know a one stop shop for conversational application development. That's really cool. Now I, I imagine that there's a like a lot of people doing bot stuff. Is there a way to package up your things and maybe share out? Or I, I'm I'm trying to see like is there's got to be like certain flows that are so common that people can share them. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something else that we've been working on. So let me uh, just jump over to this uh, new icon. Um, and you can see this in our nightly builds now. This is our package manager. And our package manager is a way for us to uh, wrap up um, maybe pre-built dialogues if you wanted to share a pre-built conversation across bots, um, or even things like custom actions. So the ability to extend Composer itself, those actions that we saw earlier, like me sending a response, I can actually extend them using the bot framework work SDK and the thing I really want to sort of hammer home and land here is that this is not a no code solution this is composer enables you to rapidly uh, do your conversational authoring as quickly as possible and then take advantage of the power of the SDK in Visual Studio because underneath composer underneath every composer project is a, a real application and you can open that in Visual Studio or Visual Studio code and extend that as you need to one package that you'll see here soon 
soon is a telephony package, which we're working on right now and will be available soon to support the telephony channel. And that will allow you to do things like start call recording or transfer uh, call with context right from within your composer authoring canvas. Uh, this is amazing. Is there like a demo that I can, is, is there, has this been published and can I call it? That, that's the question. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, why don't we uh, have you uh, try and call this bot, and um, we can uh, we can show everybody how it works. All right, I'm gonna turn my phone on here. Um, so let me turn it up so people can hear. And I'm gonna dial the number. You should be able to hear me dialing, but I'm not gonna tell you the number. Okay, okay. So here we go. I'm calling it. Hi. Thanks for calling Seawell. In just a few words, can you tell me why you're calling today? Uh, I'd like to make an appointment, an eye exam. Sure. I can help you. Okay. And do you need to purchase contact lenses following your eye exam? Yes, I sure do. Great. Have you worn contact lenses before? Yes, I sure have my whole life. Let's find a store for your appointment. Can you give me a zip code? 98008. Zero zero okay. I found the well, Optical Care located at 900 Bellevue Way, Northeast in Bellevue, Wash. Uh, I'm going to hang up there uh, because I think that was pretty cool that I was able to call it. Obviously, my phone, for some reason, I, I must be really far in the undergrounds of Bellevue. I don't live in Bellevue, but still, but that was pretty cool. Like, but here's a question. Here's a question I have. And, and hear me out here. And we're, maybe we're going off script a little bit. What if when I call it, does it have to say everything it has to say, or can I be like, excuse me, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so th that's a really good question. Um, and um, we have a feature called Bargin, which many of our competitive platforms uh, don't. And uh, maybe Vijay can, uh, can touch on that a little bit more. Yeah, um, like Bargin essentially um, is also known as allow interrupt. So, you know, there are two sets of use cases. One is sometimes when you're calling up, you know, your insurance company, you do want to play a message without being inter without you know allowing the customer to interrupt. For that, you switch it off. And then for scenarios where maybe you've called the eye clinic too many times and you just haven't been, you know, you've been changing your appointments all the time. So you know the flow already. And you just want to go in, barge in when the bot is talking to you and just get your thing done. So um, the way we do that is by offering this full duplex channel, which allows you to sort of listen as well as speak all at the same time with this telephony channel so i can yeah, call and, and interrupt and it'll be okay sorry gary right so you so you can call uh you could call the bot back and when she uh initially says to you you know how can i help you today you can just say i want to schedule an eye exam straight away without letting her finish and that will show you how the interruption works i'm gonna try it i'm gonna try it okay here we go here we go i'm gonna call it and interrupt here i'm just gonna redial from where i was before um, here we go. I'm going to interrupt a robot. I feel really bad. Here we go. Hi. Excuse Thanks me. For I'd like to schedule an eye exam. Sure. sure. Okay. And do you need to purchase contact? I see. So, so basically I hung up, I hung up on the robot. I don't feel bad, right? But basically I just interrupted and it knew where to go from that flow. Is it, am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely. So you, um, it was in the middle of a prompt, and regardless of whether or not you let the prompt 
play out. The next time that you talk to the bot, then it's going to pick up where it knows you are within the conversation. And, you know, this is a really simple example. We can, using the power of the bot framework and the SDK and Composer, we can enable other things like global interruptions, whereby at any point you could say, hey, I'd like to speak to a real person or I'd like to speak to a human. And we could do that by a traditional DTMF tone. So maybe at the beginning of the call, we've all heard it, it might say, to speak to a human, press nine at any time. And we can enable that sort of global interruption or even a natural language global interruption where you just say, even in the middle of that schedule, um, you know, the booking flow, Let's say you remember that you needed to change something. You could actually say, oh, wait, no, I meant tomorrow. Um, and we can actually use Composer to really easily uh, build in those interruptions and these really quite complex uh, conversational paradigms uh, incredibly easily. That's really cool. I felt a little guilty interrupting your bot, Gary. I just want to say that. But and I also feel like Vishesh, you missed out on a joke of like, you're going to an eye doctor and they don't want to see you. Get it. <laughs> I, you, you could have done that one a while. I, I just, my brain just clicked. This is awesome. Where can people go to find out more? Sure. Well, I've got some links that we can take a look at. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And the easiest place to start for telephony goodness is just, you know, look up for bot framework telephony channel and just do a quick search and you'll reach our um, GitHub repository. All right, say that part yeah, again. So, Sorry, say that yeah, part. Say that, say that again, Vishesh. So the easiest way to start is uh, by going to our GitHub repository. So it's, as you can see, the link out here or in the chat, or just look up Bot Framework Telephony and you'll find our GitHub repository and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And and we have a, a link there where you can download Composer and get started. And also, we would really encourage you all to head over to uh, the Ask Me Anything, which we're having uh, on the 28th of April, uh, where you'll be able to jump in and ask anything about conversational AI. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for spending some time with us to talk about not only the Azure bot service, but the bot framework composer showing us the new telephony channels, me interrupting robots. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll catch you next time. Take care. That was cool, guys. All right, so uh, uh, by the way, everybody, I've asked these wonderful gentlemen to see if they could stay afterwards to answer any questions. And they have graciously said, but of course. So let's go through the questions here because there's been a lot here. First of all, uh, here is someone saying amazing. Yeah, I know. Sorry, like when I called, for some reason, my phone was being weird because, you know, I was... Did you hear it like breaking up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah. is this me? Is this me or is this I think the it, it was me. It was me. Yeah. Gary, it's yeah. never you. <laughs> a name like Gary Pretty. I could ever be you. Ever. Uh, it was amazing. Um, even Microsoft developer was like, what up? Yeah. I, here's a scary thing. And maybe we should have done this for the demo. I have a voice font. I don't know if people know this, but for a demo <laughs> like two nights ago, I made my own voice font. And so it could have been like me responding. That would have so been. So we should be able to call Seth, right? Like we should just expose. Exactly. Why. It should you know be what? just like ask Seth. I, I'm just yeah, saying, Seth. maybe as part of the AI show, I make a, a call Seth for bad dad jokes and yell at him. That way you can just get it all out on my bot and not me. You don't have to wait <laughs> for the AI show. You'll, you'll always be there behind the phone number. <laughs> That's scary. Uh, Kevin's saying it's very nice. Yeah, this is really cool. Uh, we're getting a lot of hand claps. Felipe, he really likes that. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, here's another one from Ivana. This will work perfectly with mixed reality hologram bots. Yeah. Imagine. I love that. I yeah. know. Imagine <laughs> trying to control stuff with commands and voice and having a, the entire framework able to do that for you. That's really cool. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the great thing about the updates in Composer, right? They're not they are they are empowering you to build great experiences with experiences with the telephony channel. But just the other day, I built a bot that worked on web chat, Alexa, Google Home, the telephony channel, and you know it's just it's crazy. So speech applies to a lot uh, a lot of different channels. Now now he's just he's just showing off. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me put some background music just to make it sound like he did something heroic. Tell us all the stuff you built it on. Go. 
Alexa, Google, web chat, WhatsApp. <laughs> I feel that, man. Yeah. I feel <laughs> yeah. I feel, yeah. I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was almost like a special moment in a movie. I built it on, I built it on Alexa. I built it on a regular telephone. <laughs> Call it. Oh. Yeah. Bot Framework Composer, the movie. Yeah. I'm going to play myself. Uh, here's a bot framework guru. Composer has an HTTP request action which can be used to call virtually any web API from your bot. It, bot framework guru is doing our job for us. Oh I mean, God. that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Uh, uh, thank you uh, from Ivana. Let's see. Any Anything else we've got going on? By the way, uh, from Microsoft Developer. Uh, if you want to go to the Ask Me Anything, please go to that. They'll sit there and answer any questions. You're not going to be sure if it's them, though. No, that's not true. We have some ethical <laughs> things that we do with bots that you have to identify yourself as a not a. Yeah, we're slowly replacing everybody at Microsoft with <laughs> virtual assistants. This isn't real, Seth. <laughs> Everyone's like, I hope not. You're a weirdo. All right, here's, a, here's another one from Kevin. With the bot framework, can we integrate models for recommendation or to recognize domain-specific knowledge like medical acronyms? Yes, yeah. you can. And I, I think the the um, the important thing, as, as we tried to land in the, the main segment, is the fact that Composer um, just sits on top of the bot framework SDK, which incre is incredibly powerful. So if you want to add some middleware to your bot to be to call an API on every single request, if you want to call um, an API from within Composer and within your conversational flow, you can, you can do anything. It's a web application, essentially. And in, in addition, Often, you know, we hear customers say, hey, how do I improve the accuracy of my speech recognition or, you know, speech to text um, uh, response that I get? And in those cases, you can actually build custom speech models. And medical is a very popular domain. So I'd highly encourage you to, like, look up custom speech and, and you know, reach out to us if you need help. But you can create customized models based on the specific domains you're dealing with um, that, that are not part of the everyday English that, you know, we're, we're having a good banter on right now. I love it. I mean, look, I, I see AI as a really good tool to help support and refine the work that we do, right? Not necessarily create and define. That's different, right? Oh, that's like almost a, a catchy. Hold on, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do with some background music here. Some background music. Here we go. Here we go. AI is to help support and refine the work of humanity not create and define that's still us man that was good did anyone record that oh, i'm recording it. it i'm recording yeah. it okay any other questions here let's see go uh, go gary oh sorry i did that one go gary good job <laughs> um there you go we did that one uh seth ai yeah could come with that yes i am here i am here my friends to support and refine okay i've used that one too many times you best I mean, you best yeah. stop because netflix are going to be on the phone i know i know i know <laughs> right well they're going to be hot and not real me all right well thank you so much my friends uh you have been awesome and this has been super cool i am really excited to go make my own with my own voice like, maybe we should do that like for some of our shows i'm still making my rochambeau but maybe I can make a support chat for Rochambeau that literally like calls me and it's and I'm like hello. Well, we would we would love to help you. So you just reach out and let us know, and we'll we'll be there. You got mm -hmm. it. Here's another question before you go. Do you have any predefined models for restaurant business? I'm not sure so, if Lewis has any predefined um, models. Do you know Vishesh? Yeah, I think not specifically for um, restaurants, but there are sub segments. So you can look at predefined, a uh, pre um, pre built entities. We call it so for things like numbers and you know for ad addresses and so on. So you know, if you're, it, it's not the entire domain, but there are specific Lego blocks that would be available as pre built. Yeah, awesome. and you can build your own custom recognizer as well for um, Composer and Bot Framework. So as I said, it's very very extensible, and we have. Uh, a ton of extensibility points where you can plug in your own capabilities. 
Awesome. And as you can hear, I have introduced the walk-off music, my friends. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. It was funny. I'm going to walk. The, there's the, and they make it louder, and it's, like, uncomfortable. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks so much. We'll see you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right, my friends, uh, that was amazing. Uh, let me, uh, there you go. Uh, let me add this back uh, for our work today. That was cool. Man, I should have spent more time on that demo because I could have sent them my voice font and it could have been even more surprising. By the way, the bot framework guru says Luis Lewis. I say, it, I'm trying to say it. I'd say it in Spanish. Lewis stands for Language Understanding and Intelligence Service. As a series of predefined models, but not for restaurants. But the reality is, is that the vernacular, I think, for restaurants is quite common, as far as I know, if you're ordering. Well, that's not true, because you might have, like, special, specially named dishes. That's interesting. We need to look into that. I, I kind of, like, convinced myself it was the right thing, and then convinced myself it was the wrong thing, right? And so, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so there you go. All righty. Well, okay. So now it's time to get to work. So uh, let's do our get to work music. All right, we're going to work. If I don't play that, I haven't, I've never played it. But here's the thing. I'm going to be honest with all of us. Like they made these cool bumpers because I asked for them and I need to use them. You know what I'm saying? I feel like you, you ask someone to make you something, you got to use it. All right. Uh, comments. I'm interested in what everybody thought about this uh, stuff from Gary. The uh, here. Let me turn this on so I can uh, so I can see here. Oh, by the way, uh, for those that were 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 listening, uh, the reason I was able to call on my phone was because I have this little wire that goes into my soundboard. So uh, this panna cotta purchase paid for itself today. Uh, from Jenny Scoo 7, very cool. Yeah, I thought it was cool. Uh, from Jay McCormick was truly an awesome demonstration. It really was. Like once this stuff starts to veer into like practicality, it's like, oh, maybe I should pay attention. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm looking at my, if, see what people are telling me. Okay. Okay, so we did this. Uh, we did this bit right here. Kaboom! This was a resounding success. Now it's time to go back to our road chambo model and see where we left off, um, and go from there. We've got a good hour and eight minutes, but it seems like we always run out of time. Here, I'm just gonna. I don't need this. I don't need. Maybe I'll need. It. I'll put it over here so that way, just in case um, we need it. And I'll keep this right here. Uh, let me go. Let me go see. Let me make sure that my my friends it are okay with what I just did. Hold on. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. We have a back channel where where the marketing people are like, dude, they're not saying anything right now. So I'm okay. I'm okay. Here, here's the thing. Sometimes I don't know if you know this, but there's some shows that Microsoft puts on, like Build or Ignite. I get to do interstitial what's called in between the segments segments and um it's a wonder they haven't like been like no we we don't want him anymore so i'm i'm always nervous that i'll i'll say something weird and they're like seth you already did i know all right so let's open up visual studio code here uh boom no uh, it's time to get to work and my, I know my face is facing away from the screen. I've tried to figure out how to get StreamYard to move this over to the other side. How do I move it to the other side? I can't. Can't do it. Uh, okay, so let's go CD Rochambeau. Boop. Okay, we'll do a code dot. Boop. And now we are back. By the way, um, recently uh, I switched, uh, and this is a sidebar. Recently, I switched my Visual Studio Code like Explorer over here to the right, if you're noticing. And the reason why is because, and this is my good friend uh, from, and he lives in Tennessee. He was like, 
if you have it on the left, it moves this code over whenever you go like this. Right? It moves. And then your eyeballs get all weirded out. Now, if you're a right to left reader, obviously your eyeballs will not get weirded out. And by the way, I love the right to left languages. I studied Hebrew for a semester, and I, ha I had a guy by the name of Tuku, who was from Senegal when I lived in southern Spain, taught me how to read Arabic. We I would go to his house, and he would we would read out of the Quran. Um, I, I know it's Ramadan, so uh, happy Ramadan to whoever celebrates. I know I think you say Eid Mubarak. I think that's what you say. If you don't say it, correct me. Tell me in the chat. Uh, but they would sit there and just laugh at me because my pronunciation was so bad. So right to left. But anyways, I have this over here so that my eyeballs do not move around. And what we were doing, if I remember right, is we were moving this whole sitch that's kind of messy over into um, more, how shall I say, um, prettier code. Let's see what they're saying in the teams here. So I want to make sure I don't want to. They might be like, hey, you forgot something. And then we got to redo it. Okay, no. Good. Okay, so here you remember we actually rebuilt our entire model and put it into a, Py a PyTorch Lightning module. And it was just much, it was just better. I mean, this, as a programmer, doesn't this just look, doesn't this just look better? Right? Uh, and then, so there's our model. And then for our data, Here's our data. And this, to me, is just, this all just looks much better to me um, than what we're doing before. The, the one thing with, that we did that we did miss out on, uh, let me go to my, I think it's in train. So open to the side uh, and move this away. So the one thing that we did miss out on in this is I had two transforms, one for the training data set and one for the validation data set. But I kind of just undid that. I hope that's okay. I think it's okay. I think because the difference here uh, is the random horizontal flip and the random resize crop. Uh, and this, maybe I need to figure out how to do that. Oh, well, no, I, I don't want to get derailed. Remember, I want let's 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 do the thing. Save and load a model. Better arg parse scoring file. Okay, so let's get to it. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions about any of this, literally go and ask in the chat, and I will I will stop because this is it's not for me; it's for y'all. Uh, let me get a sip of my drink here. This is for y'all, and a reminder: we're building an AI that recognizes me doing rock, paper, and scissor. Okay, so let's get to it. And again, if I'm if I'm this way, uh, apologies. It's because I'll look over, but that's where my screen is right there. Okay, so let's go back here and let's go to the main.py, and it looks like this is how we ran it. This doesn't look right. I wonder why it's not importing. If you ever run into something like this, it might just be also because notice that it treats these as Python modules and it doesn't know where it lives. So let's go to the settings.json and let me show you how to fix that. So Python uh analysis dot extra paths and our extra path oh sorry python uh we're gonna say dot source so as soon as we do that watch this oh dang it I was, it was supposed to uh, it was in main main Boop. see now it's all good remember how it didn't well, I'll, I'll do that again because i think i think i went too fast no not score model so model so let me save that let me take this out control x and watch it, it like it all of a sudden it's like eh, i don't know where this is i don't know where this is all if that ever happens to you just literally just put say hey here's some extra paths that you need to look for in order to get the actual code stuff and then you'll see it's all happy and then you can do cool stuff like data module dot and you can see all of the good stuff that's on there right and this is really cool because you know with dynamic languages sometimes it's a little hard to know what's going on um but not with Visual Studio Code, kapow. Okay. All right. So before we get going, I just want to make sure everyone's okay. We all we're all kosher on what it is that we we got going on here. So so model, data, and main. Anyone want me to go over anything on what these three files are doing to build our model? Remember, we we're changing from 
this ugliness i'll put this over here this ugliness to something that's more modular you know because the reality is look like usually the what happens is you get like a a notebook and you're like put this into production and it's like you know you can't put you can't put python uh, uh ipython I, ipymbs into production that's not how it works now you could also you could also just put the model that comes out of it in the production but that feels like something we did in like 2005 you know where you built an xc and put it in a folder we don't do that like we we are engineers right and so we can't do that Okay, so nobody's uh, pushing any questions in here. That's okay. Uh, that's perfect. So that means you got it. This is our data. This is our model. Uh, notice that we have a, we're using transfer learning. We're using a ResNet 18 for hours. And then we have a linear. Uh, also, like for example, you might, you might even be able to self, because uh, these numbers seem kind of, we'll go to the fully connected layer. And I think you can get um, out, out, out features. Right, if you're wondering, like this is how you get the actual number, but I just knew it. Uh, so that's the out features on the fully connected layer of the ResNet, right? Uh, which is cool, right? So now you know that should work. Uh, there's this. Uh, this we can take out. Uh, okay, I think uh, let's run it and let's make sure everything's good. So I'll do this, uh, boop, and then I'll hit F5, and then remember. Just as we go through this, you'll start to see everything is happening. I think, I think, unless I have to push more strategic break breakpoints, like on the model, for example, I might have to. Oh, there you go. So we'll do F11 here. We're getting the data DIR. Ba 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 ba. F10. Boop. Uh, there's the transform. We're getting the data set, the raw data set. For those that are, don't remember. The data is coming from here, you know, non-rock, paper, scissors, just to give you a... Who's that guy? Okay. Uh, so there are the classes. Remember, there's, let's see, there's four non-paper, rock, scissors. We're getting the size of the data set. We only have 364 images, which might be, this is bad, FYI. And this is why we want to solidify this training process so that as we get more images it's easy to do to make changes in a principled way the training size would be 291 the validation size is 73 random split here for the data set the, the setup is done let's go into here let's uh, here are all the classes that we've got there's four uh the learning rate is passed in at 0 0.01 we're using a, we're using a pre-trained resnet yes we are there's the model you can see it's all up in there beautiful uh, and then we'll do a fully connected layer and a fully connected layer okay very good so let's go th through here and let's get the trainer uh gpu we're gonna do one and then we're gonna do a fit on the trainer for the model and with the data module we'll hit a five and we should hit we should hit the forward method yes booyah so before you remember and this is important that in our training, we actually embedded in the sequential model the actual non-linearities. These things, my wonderful friends, are called activation. Oh, uh, I was going to put action functions, but no. Activation functions. What these do is these introduce the non-linearities that make neural networks so powerful. Right? Because if you had, if you if you basically, look, here, let me let me do some, some mathiness. So basically... Uh, Let's just say w, uh, Wx plus B. Uh, this is obviously there's some notational weirdness. This should be a transpose right there. But basically, this is the fundamental unit of a neural network. And what happens is then what you do is you place it in another function, right? And another function like this. And this is what a neural network becomes. If you think about it, if you were to pull the middle of that function up, all the way to the top, it basically becomes like this big tree of computations. That's what a neural network is. Um, and that's why you have these layers, right? But the reality is if you do not have a, a, what we call an activation function, a linear combination of a linear combination is still a linear combination. And you can prove that inductively quite easily. And so you have to add these, these non-linearities inside in order to make it 
inside the function in order to make it more powerful at discriminating between pictures. And then the other thing that's interesting is in theory, these functions all have to have what are called a derivative. They need to be differentiable. So you need to be able to, see, you need to, be able to say d by dx of ReLU, right? But this function is interesting because it doesn't, it's not, it's not differentiable. It's basically zero until it's not. And right here at zero, this is non-differentiable, but we've somehow managed to fudge our way through it. This one is differentiable, by the way. So yeah, funny mathy things along with neural networky things make for crazy time. So let's go to the model, remember? Uh, okay, so what I was saying is, notice that these lin non-linearities were introduced directly inside of the model, but for us, we don't have to do that, right? Because this does, this does not have to be saved because it's just a function. And if you look over here, I'm just importing the functions as F as a thing you run, not a thing you save. And so we only save the things we have to, which are the actual models. That's kind of not true because in here, you know, there's some stuff burned in, but that's what I'm going to stick with. Okay. Uh, by the way, questions or comments, keep them coming. Uh, I'm watching them. Maybe it's still not hooked up. Someone say hello. I want to make sure it's still working. I feel like, hello? Is anyone there? All right, let's keep going. So here is the forward pass on the model. And if you think about it, the forward pass is basically executing that large crazy function, right? It's basically saying, give me a picture and then out, let me give you an answer. Right, and so that's what's happening here. So if I, if I go out on this uh, and I go F10, You'll see that, uh, oh, hopefully it's still alive. There it is, it just takes a while. Notice that this is a huge tensor that comes out. Well, not huge. Where's the size here? Let's get the dimension. There's a there's a property called shape. There it is, it's eight by 100,000, right? And the reason why is because we executed this transfer thing on X, got the ReLU, and then that's what came out. Let's do F10 again. But this one's a little bit faster. Hola desde Ecuador. Bienvenido, mi amigo. Aquí estamos haciendo el IA. Okay, and here's another one. This one should be like super small. Where's the shape? Uh, shape, 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 shape. No, what am I doing? X. X should be number of dimensions two, version. Where's the shape? Where are you, shape? Help me. Obi Wan Kenobi. And then finally, we do soft max and out comes this thing and here's the prediction remember the prediction is going to be a tensor of size four and each one of those tensors tell us the probability now i i say probability but not probability it's not the probability it's just not under real i mean i guess you could maybe i don't know i'd have to ask this maybe i'll ask david smith he's what he's our resident r expert and statistician him and I have talked about this, and he seems to agree with me. But these are the probability densities of it being the right thing. Uh, would be nice if there was a summary method to see the model layers and shape per layer. There is. Um, there is, uh, Kevin. Maybe we should figure that out today instead of my other stuff if I run out of time. There's a way to do what's called TensorBoard X and show the shape directly inside. Usually you have to look inside of like uh, Netron. Um, but there you go. So there's a loss. Uh, you can see the loss is also a tensor. That's the loss. Uh, this is the predictions that it's making. It's predicting one, one, two, one, one, blah. And then this is the accuracy on the prediction. The accuracy is garbage. And then we have five and you can see as we keep going, it'll keep calling forward in this wonderful Lee big loop. Here we go. Magic is happening. Whoa, validation accuracy went up to 95%. Here we go. So this is happening. Wonderful. There you go. Uh, it's using my GPU. You see that? It's like, yep, using my GPU. You're probably wondering what kind of GPU I have. Not the one I want. Let's go to perf, and you can see my GPU is like, hey, yo, I'm doing some work. I'm doing some work. Uh, hey, yo, using up some RAM. 
By the way, it's an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 with Max-Q design. I don't know what this means, but somebody's going to be jealous. All right. By the way, speaking of workstations, I would love to have. How about how about this one? NVIDIA work NVIDIA workstation. Let's let's Google it with Bing here. What what do we got? What do we got? Um, because it's building, right? We just let it do its thing. Uh oh, hey. Sorry, do so do y'all look at stuff like this every once in a while? Like, hmm, I wonder if I if I had one of these, what would it mean? It means I could put a billion pictures of me doing rock, paper, scissors. Oh, this is this is concerning though. Usually this means it's gonna be expensive. If they don't put the price, if they don't put the price on the on the website, it's gonna be expensive. The like I call the I call the robot and be like, hello. Have you secured a mortgage for this machine? Yes, I'm pre-approved. Okay. So notice that this thing is still going. Um, this is great. Uh, everything's happening the way we want it to. But the reality, we're on ep Epoch 20, but the reality is I don't know. Like, I didn't tell it to stop. So is this just going to go forever? Like, how do we tell things to stop? Uh, I feel like we need to get some we need to get some answers, and we need to start making this a little bit better. Again, the we're gonna do the save load model, better arg parse scoring file. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so PyTorch, PyTorch, lightning. Let's go to the tutorials. Bonjour. That's not what I want. Let's go to the docs. Yellow. Uh, and let's go to the trainer because my guess is that we need to tell it to stop. I need to give it like how many epochs to give it. Yeah, this is wonderful. Beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have to do a British accent. A horrible, one. horrible one. By the way, if anyone from the UK is watching, I'm so sorry. It's Friday night. Like you're still young. Live your life. Hmm. Took a sip there. All right. So let's see if there's anything about epochs. Well, if I'd spell it right, epochs. Okay. No accumulation for epochs one through four. What does that do? Grad batches. No, I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. By the way, looks like it does know about epochs. Wonderful. Uh, check Val N train epochs. Oh, this is cool. Because, I mean, like if I run this thing for 50 epochs, right? Why do I want to validate? Ah, no, this is cool. Did this freeze? No, it's still going. It's still going. What, just get warm in here? Is my computer on fire? It's just me. It's just me. I got this. Okay, so let's go now into the next epochs. Here we go. Max epochs. Stop training once this number of epochs is reached. Okay. So I can just put that in the trainer, right? Wonderful. So let's put that in the trainer. Uh, uh, let's do, I don't know. How many did we do last time? Let's see here. Let's go to the trainer here, the old school code. The goal is to delete all the other ugly code. Okay. By the way, remember I stole this from hot dog versus pizza and tacos versus burritos. And so this model is getting a lot of mileage. Okay. 25 epochs. So max epochs 25 here. Fantastic. Uh, so we'll control C this. Yes. Lovely. Now I should be able to CLS uh, Python. Uh, Python train. No, that's not the one, remember, because it's main now. Mm. Python main.py. And so now it should only go max 25 epochs. Okay, that's good. Uh, let's control C out of that. Uh, let's see what else we can control. Just to to save the model. So this is cool. This makes it so that we can stop. So let's go now here and let's go to the actual save and load model. So saving and loading weights. Look at that. How helpful is that? Lightning, Lightning automatically saves, automates saving and loading of checkpoints. The checkpoints capture 
the exact value of all parameters used by model. That's wonderful. Checkpointing your training allows you to resume training process in case it was interrupted. Fantastic. A lightning checkpoint has everything you need to restore a training session, including blah, current epoch. Well, this is nice. Okay, so automatic saving. Oh, cool. Okay, so this is important because it's been, I guess it's just been putting it wherever it wants to, right? Oh, it puts it here. Interesting. Um, I kind of want to put it in outputs, right? So it feels like there's there's cool. Look at that. Looks like there's TF events coming out. So I should be able to actually see this in TensorBoard. Hmm. And then looking at the tent, uh, checkpoints, very nice. What is this hyperparams thing? Nothing. Holy cow, there's so much that we haven't investigated. So let's get the root DIR and put it on outputs uh, so that, uh, by the way, again, this is part of the whole, like, we're going to get a better arg parse to pass in parameterizations of this thing. So uh, let's go to main. And what was I doing? Uh, trainer default root DIR. Oakley doakley. So here we go. Defi default root DIR. Obvi. Outputs. Oh, not capitalized, though. Oh. Okay, so let's do it again. Let's do it again and see what it does. Lightning logs, don't fail me now. Uh, Kevin's saying we, it would be good to add an early stopping definition too. Yeah, because like I'm just doing this. So for those that are wondering what Kevin's talking about, I'm just running it for this. But if my validation accuracy gets to like one and then my training accuracy gets to like 90, uh, like one, like I should just stop. Like it's not gonna. I'm not gonna squeeze any more lemon, juice out of those lemons. Uh, good call. Good. See, look at that. Look at that. I mean, what's the point of even training anymore? I'm on epoch five. Uh, good call, Kevin. So let's uh, let's write that on our things to do here. Uh, uh, right here. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. we'll do here. Oh, I gotta get my thing out. Let's get this out. Got to do it. Got to write it down. Got to write it down. Hello, Zimi. Welcome to the stream. We're building AI. It's fantastic. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And then and then we'll we'll do a little parenthetical here. Early stopping. Good. 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 Okay. Cool. 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 I was watching Community the other day with my daughter. That show is so funny. Up until Mr. Glover left, and then I couldn't watch it anymore. FYI. Okay, so this is going, look, it's, and this is what I'm talking about. It's just, nothing's happening anymore. Look at the, look at the loss between the training and the validation. It's literally identical. Literally identical. By the way, that's where the cool, 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 cool comes from. Community. So, oh, by the way, we want to see if the outputs are being put in the right spot. So there's the outputs. Yep, lightning logs are in there. Wonderful. So we're putting things in the right spot. Kevin, you're right. The paintball wars were the best. My favorite was when they like reenacted like an old school like documentary of the Civil War. So funny. Although maybe too soon. Is it too soon? Maybe. Okay. Okay, so these logs are going to the right spot. Let's clear all these out because ain't nobody got time for this. Boop. Look, I try to open it. That's cute. I need to stop this. Everything's everything's slowing down. Everything is slow. Okay. I didn't interrupt. It's good. So let's delete these. We don't need these. We've got the logs going to the right spot on the output. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, it's going to take its sweet time. So we don't need this anymore. So let's get rid of this here. Yes. Delete it. Cancel. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, then we have this. We don't need this anymore. Uh, delete. We'll look into early stopping here in a second. Well, let's let's just do the save and load model first. So, so notice that this is doing the training, calculating metric, do the do the logs. We figured out the logs last time. Do you guys, do you guys and gals remember Ren and Stimpy from a long time ago? The log song. 
It's pretty good. Uh, looks like there's a checkpointing uh, here. Yo, oh, this is cool. Hmm. Model checkpoint. Save top K equals three. Mode equals min. Well, you know what? Um, Kevin, we might be able to do checkpointing right now. Look at that. What's up? No code action available. All right, let's find out where this where this beautiful Oh, here it is. What it is. Hmm. Mm, this is just great stuff. By the way, one of my colleagues, uh Ari, one of my friends, he works over there. He convinced me to look into this stuff because like this is this is beautiful. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Outputs. And then let's just do, I don't know, models. It's not simple. Mnist. It's Rochambeau. Rochambeau. Boop, boop. Uh, validation loss. Uh, let's do... Wait a minute. I think this has to do exactly with what we put out here, which is this. I don't know. Is validation loss better or validation accuracy? Oh, is art was uh, so? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yvonne, I I had never heard of it either until Ari pointed it out. Um, he, he we were working on the same team, and then and then he did some PyTorch Lightning stuff. He showed me. I was like, this is cool. And then they hired him to lead all their DevRel, and I was like, dude, hate to lose you, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, Kevin, uh, is Ari going to come back for a lightning uh, lightning target? Ari hasn't come on yet. Uh, he's in Israel, and so right now, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'd have to, like, in, like interrupt his Friday evening, you know? I don't know if he'd like that. I'll ask him. Uh, I'll write down on my things to do. Hey, hey, Ari, come, come tell me my PyTorch lightning code sucks. So we got validation loss. Let's do validation accuracy instead. Is everyone okay with that? I just closed the main file. That's not what I wanted. Doop, doop, doop. Oh, Kali Dokali. And then how do we put this in here? Uh, doo, 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 doo. On the callbacks. Mm. Oh, and then you can. Oh, this is cool. Okay. All right. All right. Let's try this. Let's do this. Looks like the trainer is like the kitchen sink. All right. Anything that doesn't go anywhere else, just make the trainer do it. It's like real life. All right. So comma here. Beep, beep, beep. Love it. Let's do this. Let's run it. Beep. And let's see what happens. Everyone cross your fingers while I take a sip. Okay. Let's go to outputs. There's the lightning logs. Oh, there you go. Hey, yo. What is it saving, though? Oh, it's a checkpoint. What is this? I should just, I should put it into a checkpoints folder. That would be better. Uh, checkpoints. Love it. Okay. Uh, no, so Kevin is asking is the checkpoint is the checkpoint callback the same as the early stopping or is it just when it is saving a new checkpoint? It's just saving a new checkpoint. Uh, but early stopping, like I'm guessing that there's a callback in here for me to do like early stopping. And so I just wanted to add this in because I'm doing model saving. But my sense is that it will let us do more stuff. Uh, line 15 file name should be val accuracy let's take a look here oh you're right you're right Doop -doop. boom thank you jay for the assist because then this is this looks weird right good call my bud so let's do that again let's just clear out everything in the folder uh, control boop, and then we'll just delete. Go away. 
do it again. Uh, nice. Okay, so here we go. Run again. Magic is happening. There is the version zero. After it's done with the first, uh, it should do a checkpoint. There you go. Very nice. Very nice. This is beautiful. Thanks, Jay, for the assist on that. Okay, so I don't know if this is saving, saving things, though, for production. This is like, I call I like to call this the machine learning exhaust that we keep and save and look at later. Uh, you can disable checkpointing by blah. Lightning checkpoint also saves arguments passed into lightning module under hyper... What? Lightning modules. Okay. So let's go over here. Let's go to the model here. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Let's try that. I don't know what this does. Well, let's run again. Let's clear out everything so that we all know we're starting afresh. And then let's run it again. Here we go. By the way, hopefully those that are watching are like watching me like do, I'm literally building an AI program uh, and you're getting a sense for like, oh, this feels like Seth's doing actual normal coding. Uh, what did that do? Oh, look at that. Oh my gosh. Sorry, that was loud. It saved. It saved my parameters that I passed into the module. That's cool. So we get we get not only what's going on here, because my guess is that I could probably look at this in TensorBoard, but it's giving me the params that I passed in. Sorry, I got so loud. That was that was loud. Apologies. I will be nicer. Okay, so that was cool too. So that's what that did. It looks like we're just adding a whole bunch of cool little bells and whistles to this. Uh, let's keep going. Manual saving. You can manually save checkpoints and restore your model to the checkpointed state. Turn out save checkpoint. My model dot load from checkpoint. Is this though what we want to? And like I can't like because it remember back like I, I think what episode? We're in episode eight. Back in episode one, like I was running all this in the browser, and so I wanted to use Onyx. So because there's this Onyx JS thing. Here it is. Because you can ba basically run Onyx models directly from JavaScript. People don't know this because everyone's like all about TensorFlow.js, which is great. I mean, if you like TensorFlow.js, that's great. I just want to try something different. Uh, oh, look at that. Looks like it's fast using the WASM web worker. And so there's got to be a way to save this thing as an Onyx file because this is all good. I like the checkpointing, but... Hmm. Uh, let's see. Onyx. I don't see it here. Uh, I think this isn't, this is gonna, this is all checkpointing. Let's go over here and see if we have anything else. So we have training, clustering modules, early stopping. Oh, there, look at this. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put that in there. That way I can take off like uh let's put this in there. I'm I'm a guess that we have this. I was right. And then I can do this. Uh so min delta zero, patience three verbose false mode max and we want we're not val accuracy we're val act look at that i can probably take off the fact that we're even doing max epochs okay so that was like a sidebar but uh kevin i think we're gonna do this part here we go let's give it a try okay look at Look at this coolness. Boom. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully it'll just stop. Like, cause I didn't give it a max epoch. Uh, there's a validation accuracy. It's at 83 by epoch five. It's going to be at one. So it should just stop. 
after this one, it's going to shoot up to the 90s, I think. 90s, 90s. Here we go. Here we go. 90s, 90s. Boom. Okay, now it has a patience of three. So it's going to... Patience of three. So two more epochs and it'll just stop. Here we go. Okay, I'll let it do its thing. Still at one. It's going to run out of patience. I think I'm reading this right. Patience means that it, this is how long it waits before it's like, okay. And if the delta is zero, it's going to be like, okay, I'm done. And it's going to go on the max. Uh, three. So at epoch four, it should stop, right? After epoch four. Here we go. Please stay at one. Still at one. Still at one of validation. After this, it should be like, hey, I'm tapping out. I'm not doing any good. This is cool. Uh, good call, uh, Kevin, for uh, telling us to do that. Mm, so now we've got some intelligence built into here, which is nice. Again, this is why I like using like PyTorch Lightning Framework because the stuff that you would normally have to code up, you're just like, I don't want to. Okay, it stopped. Mmm. 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 That was beautiful. Okay. Let's do an Onyx search. Uh, Kevin's like, hey, why don't you just use the program the right way, Seth? I will. Onyx. Boom. Inference in production. That's what. Oh, look at this. Boom. Model.2 Onyx. My goodness. Uh, and by the way, since it's going to stop right after this, like it's literally going to be the right thing. So we want to do... Mm, let's do this. Outputs. Model. Hold on. Let me make sure. Make sure you're... File path. Uh, outputs dot model dot. Hmm, let's do an F string here. And let's do uh, dot onyx. Okay. Looks like uh, the input sample. This is always interesting. And the reason why is because um, onyx. The thing about PyTorch that's interesting is because it's a dynamic graph execution, it saves all of the model parameters, but when you harden it to, to an onyx, it needs to know the exact path that it took. And so we're going to say torch.rand. Import torch. Uh, torch.rand, and then we just got to give it shape, right, is my guess. And I think I'm going to say 1 by 3 by 224 by 224. I think that'll work. And then here for the F string, what we need to do is we just need to do like a like a date time dot now. Uh, uh, Python string interpolation. Python date time string. Boop. I never remember this. Boom. We are just killing it today. Okay. So we'll just do this. We'll just do something like this, you know. Uh, cool. Uh, not now. Uh, let's see. Where's, where's now come from? Oh, here we go. Doop, 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 doop. Up. Uh, we don't need this. We do, but not right now. Uh, we'll go like this. This is just to give us, like, when we save the model, um, a month, a day, year, uh, hour, dot, minute, dot, a second. I think this will do it. But I don't know. 
And the other thing is, I, I'm guessing on this, uh, let's take a look at the, these are checkpoint files. Let me, let me see if I can see them inside of, uh, yeah, I won't open these. All right. Well, let's just let it explode. Let's do this though. Let's do uh, max, max epochs equals one. Just so, just so we can see if we can get it out. Uh, cause hopefully it'll do this first. Okay. So let's see, let's see if it saves it. Uh, okay. And then we're going to clean this up. Remember the second part is we're going to clean this up with, uh, arc parse. Okay. Yeah. Boom on that one. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, one, one epoch. Here we go. Okay. Invalid format string. Ugh. This is so dumb. Let's do this. Let's just F5 this. And let me show you a little little secret trick. The secret trick. Go to debug console here. And we're going to say uh, datetime.nail. Datetime.nail dot... All right, let's see what happens. Cool. So this is working. So uh, we'll do uh, day, um, month. What is that? Okay, month. Uh, dot. Dot year. Okay. 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 Cool. cool, cool, cool. Now, should I? I'm just going to go full European and start with a day first because that literally makes sense. Or maybe I'll just, uh, I wonder if there's a way to like have the actual. I wonder what capital M does. 36? What? There's like a, there's like a whole thing about like, where's the table? Yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. Where's the table though? Uh, Uh, let's do this. Here we go. That's what we wanted. We're going to go B. Nice. Nice. And then we're going to do an underscore here. Do, 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 do. Underscore. And then we're going to do... Um, there we go. We're going to do hour. There's the minute. Hour. Minute. Second. Where's the second? Second. Okay. Hour, minute, second. Hour. Minute, second. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So it's capital H. H. Dot. Minute. Dot. Okay, this is what we wanted. I don't know why I got it wrong. Okay. Use 24 o'clock. Okay. Uh, is that with capital H? Uh, Jay saying capital M is minutes. Okay, 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 okay. Capital M is minutes. Are we sure capital M is minutes? Let's take a look. Oh, you're right. You are right. I'm doing literally the month. That would have been a tremendous oversight. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was uh, that was from Jay. He used the 24 o'clock. Uh, cap M is minutes. And the 24 o'clock, um, that's with capital H, right? 24 o'clock? Uh, capital H, minute, uh, capital H. Yeah, hour, 24. I'm okay with that. I used to live in Spain and... Uh, He's okay. He's okay. Perfect. So that's what we want. So let's take this. Like this. Let's take this beautiful string. Let's put it in here, and this should then do the right thing. So we'll hit. We'll stop this, and then we can go back to the terminal, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, do it again. Ah, 
no such file or directory. What? All right. Uh, let's do from lib import path. Um, model dir equal path. This beautiful thing dot resolve. Mm -hmm. If uh, model model dir dot exists, but not not. Oh, did I spell outputs wrong? Yes, I did. Oh my gosh. I'm like all doing all this extra code and it's just like I didn't need to. All right, let's 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 uncomment this. Um, but by the way, Jay is like the best debugger ever. It looks like Kevin also got it too. Um cool, 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 cool. So by the way, we need to re- we need to re get all these funny strings out of the way and literally like have these passed in somehow. Uh, that's, that's important to me. So, because we want to make this so that we can totally like this, we want this code to be like actual like code, not this, not this. I don't like the way data science right now is like you make a notebook and then that's the thing it, that's not that you need to, you have that process. This is software that we need to. Okay. So there's nothing there. So let's do this. Oh, do, do. Uh, welcome to my TED talk. Uh, there needs to be there needs to be like rigid engineering stuff for this to work. So uh, create a directory. How do you create a directory in uh, Python? Uh, path lib create dir with file path out do, 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 do. Okay. The pathlib module offers an open method that has a slightly different signature to be to the built-in open function. Okay. In this case, in the case of this, p equals path, it has created a path p. So calling p.open with a position argument not using keywords expects the first to be mode. Okay, this is not what I want. Oh, let me just do create your OS. I think it's os.makeDurs. Let's just use the OS. Uh, import import is OS, and we'll just say uh, OS dot make durs, and then we'll say a string of model dir. And let's see if it's okay with this. By the way. Um, I like doing the resolve just because it makes takes all these things out. Let me show you. I'll just F5 it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I got that. Yes, we're here. We know this part works. I don't know if Python has editing continue, to be honest. I don't think. So here we go. By the way, my name has been on it the whole time. I don't need that. Okay, here we go. So model dir. Take a look at what it did when I did a... Um, oh, uh, take a look at what I did when I did a resolve, which is super nice, right? And so now if it doesn't exist, which it doesn't, uh, let me F10 here. It'll make it. Hi. Don't get mad at me. F5. Booyah. Mm. Many of you might be wondering, how did you know that this was the shape that you needed to pass in? Well, we've done this model so much that remember I told you about the channels and I told you about the cropping to 224. This, I put a one in here because in theory, you can pass n number of pictures into it. I think that's the right thing. Let me open it up here. I might be wrong.
Oof. I think this forces it to be one, even though I want it to be N. Let me look at my other models here. Let me look at my other models here. Uh, CD, food AI. Okay, well, that's CD outputs. Uh, Explorer dot. Let's open. Why can't I see file extensions? View. Oh, well, who turned that off? Here we go. Open this up. See what this looks like. Yeah. Yeah, this is right. I was right. Uh, that's how I... Yep. Yeah. And let's look at the path file. Path. Uh, PyTorch file. Yeah, see, this This is stored differently. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's all in there, but it's stored differently. And the reason why it has to be stored differently is because these modules have weight in them, but how they're assembled is done dynamically in PyTorch, uh, which is why you probably see these all like in separate places, um, but not here, right? These things have to be connected uh, because you got to give it a thing. And this, obviously, this looks like a ResNet, right? A ResNet 18. Okay, we've got it. We are on our way. So now let's do a good training here. Let's leave everything on. Let's take off the max epochs and let's let it do its thing. And then we'll start to arg parse the heck out of this so that we can pass things in. Okay, so Python train. Here we go. Look at this beautiful AI. Oh, this is the wrong one. You idiot. What am I doing? Oh, here's another thing, though. I forgot about the model meta. L let me run this again real quick. It's main, right? It's not supposed to be trained. But look. Remember this model meta file? We need to know about the classes. Otherwise, we're not going to do this. So as part of the saving of the model, right, we actually need to save the classes. And in the DM, uh, in the data module, let's go to that. Here's the classes. Self.classes is a list of string. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. How did we save that before? Looks like we did it like that. Classes as part of the model. Wonderful. So let's do that again. Let's go to the training and let's just literally copy that code out because ain't nobody got time for making more stuff. Here it is. Here it is. And then we just need the classes, right? Coo, 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 coo. That's part of the saving. We're going to clean this up, by the way. Um, uh, it's outputs model uh, now for us. I wonder if we should F string this too. I wonder if we should F, F string this too with this. So that it's like exactly the same thing, right? We'll F string it. And then we'll just say JSON. Right? Because I mean, I, I'm trying to be all super cool. And then we need some JSON here. Import JSON. JSON. Um, and then we'll just put this up here. Kapow. And now we're like, well, where to get this from? Well, it's in the data module, right? Booyah magic wow feels like we should add like some save code somewhere you know as part of the oh maybe we can put it inside of the this let's see if this works and then we'll refactor then we'll refactor yeah let's do this and then we'll, and then we'll refactor okay oakley dokley keyboard interrupt oh geez i destroyed it life is over okay good here we go. We did that. Uh, and then we want a CD source. Thank you. And then Python main. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, let's delete everything in here. We have so many checkpoints. Uh, we'll delete the logs here. And then we'll delete the models. We don't need this file. Okay. 
All right, Python main, and let's see what we got. Well, we got a lot done, honestly. In like, this is an hour of time. We got a lot done. Um, I'm pretty impressed with this framework. Sorry, my my headphones just popped out because it got stuck on my chair. I'm pretty impressed with this framework, though. Like, it's pretty cool. All right, so it should stop on its own after epoch number four. Saving. Done. So we, sh we should have our checkpoints. We should have our checkpoints. There's the checkpoints. There was only three. We should have our logs. There they are. Version zero of the thing we ran. Wonderful. And then we should have our model. Booyah! Hey, yo! What it is? No, I actually, uh, this is a fun salat saying chair probably hurts too. No, I actually spent some money on a good chair. It's nice. Like, I, it's like one of those chairs where you're like, ah, oh, I enjoy sitting down. You know? So, yeah. Okay. Okay, it's not. We got everything working. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Let's go ahead and refactor the save. Uh, the save out. Mm. Let's. Should we? What do y'all think? Should we? Should we refactor? Should we refactor the save to just be like model dot save, and then it just does whatever we tell it to, just does the right thing. I think we should. Right. Let's put that in here. Model, and then we can do um, f save. Right, uh, self, and then uh, uh, I hope I'm not overwriting. Let's just do that, uh, and then and then and then uh, model dir is a string equals uh, pass to model model, and let's just uh, get some stuff over here. Let's copy this out. Boof. So we need this. All of this. We'll just put over here. We need some from path lib import path. Good. And then we need some OSing. There's some OSing and some date times. Uh, from date time import uh, import date time and then import os by the way you see me moving these things it's just out out up and down because as you can tell i may be a little ocd maybe maybe uh the jason uh oh that's right that's right the jason thank you thank you that's uh from uh jay mccormick don't forget jason import Jason, fantastic. And now, in theory, we could say self, self dot to onyx. And what we could do is we could say on the path, we can say um, model dir equals, let's do this. How about in the model dir, we instead save like the action into like a fold, I don't know. I don't know, because I, I like having a standard Onyx file if we get for later on. But we'll just worry about that later. We'll just worry about that. Path uh, model dir dot resolve right, and then we'll oh look at that, boof! Look at that! Look at that! It's almost as if it was meant to be. Oh, this is a problem. This is a problem. How do we get the classes out of here? Oh. I think I pass in the number. If you use save DR, it's not good. You can always get path using file. Uh, here's, yeah. Uh, I do. I think the reason why, uh, and just fun a lot, just for your, you're right. But what's going to happen is eventually when I move this to the cloud, all these paths are like something else, but I don't want to think about it. 
right? So maybe I can put in here uh, the classes, which is going to be a list of string. And you're probably wondering, what the heck does that mean? Right, from typing import list. Nope. Here we go. Classes is not acceptable. Yeah, let me let me not give these default strings so that they're forced. Okay, and then we'll just say classes. Problem solved. Now what we need to do is we need to say, um, oh, wrapping in five. Okay, so wrapping in five. So we're say path uh, model dir plus uh, this dot json, right? It's an F string, right? This is going to be the, the JSON file. J equals this. And so we just say like this. String of J dot resolve. Resolve. Uh, uh, can, uh, without extension can reuse. Yes. Yes. Even smarter. So let me do this here. Uh, full, uh, full path equals model dir dot here. Okay. And then what I can do is I can say, um, uh, let me just do dot resolve. Resolve. Uh, okay. And then I can say, hmm, why is this making it? Why is this so hard? Uh, I'm, I'm like having brain problems here. So, so we'll do this dot JSON. And then we'll just do the string of this. I want to finish this. Okay. This looks good. Uh, this looks good. So we'll do the F string of this right here. Like so. But it's going to be dot onyx. Oh, resolve. What it does is it makes sure that it's the right, the full path. Cause I might, you might pass in like a relative path. Uh, I don't need to resolve it. I don't think, uh, because I already resolved it at the top. So that's probably a good call. Okay. Okay. So now let's go over to main.py and let's just say uh, model dot, dot save. And then we'll pass in the model dir, which is going to be this. And the classes, which is dm.classes. Now we can take all of this ugliness out. All of this ugliness out. And when this works, uh, when this works, uh, I am going to, we're going to be excited. A fun slot says, oh, oh uh, it says, oh, now you can work in Microsoft. Definitely. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the idea is that this will work anywhere in any cloud. Uh, the reality is that pathing is just going to be different wherever you put stuff. And so I'm trying to make it agnostic to path. Uh, great, great comment here. Okay, so as it's going, I want to everyone to know coming up next week, um, my colleague Aishigal and Vanessa are going to be continuing to work using Azure Cognitive Services while building an AI playground app. By the way, it worked. Uh, looks like it worked. Look at that. It's all there. That's great. So now look at this code, though. This this is starting to look like something that we could be proud of. We didn't quite get to the arg parse bits. Next time, we'll get to the arg parse, arg parse and then get to the scoring file. But this is starting to look really good. Really, really good. We're, I'm going to start to pass some of these things in. That way, we don't have to. But it's been fun. Y'all are the best. Uh, I'm so glad you came. And I can't wait to see you in two weeks. But make sure next week to tune in. 
to my colleague Aishigol, who's been talking about cognitive services and building on top of cognitive services. I hope we will see you then. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.